Hola a todos, estamos aquí en el nuevo canal de Red Cultural de YouTube eh, y tenemos hoy un invitado muy importante, el profesor Michael Burley, uno de los historiadores más conocidos en, hoy día, bueno, en el Reino Unido y en el mundo. Eh, y tenemos el privilegio de tenerlo aquí con nosotros. Hi Mark, Michael, welcome to Red Cultural Channel. Uh, it is an honor for us to have you here. Uh, people are wondering if we are near now to the Third World War. Is it true? No, not at all. This is just newspaper headlines. We're not going to have a Third World War at all. Always dangerous, of course, to make such predictions. Um, I think that uh, there are certainly problems and crises in the world, but the Third World War would be a whole different level of aggression and difficulty, and we're nowhere near that. And is the way the West now really in a decline? It's this the Untergang des Abeslandes, as Spengler says? No, I would, I would put it differently. I mean, obviously, Western economies are extremely strong. Um, we have a very good way of life, we're culturally significant, but I, I also think that we're reverting, going back to the world in about 1890 or 1900, after a period of two-power hegemony in the Cold War, and now we have four or five major powers and then more regional powers, so it's a more complicated place and the West is going to have to learn to share power with other people. And know really the West to share? Hmm? N know the West how to share? <laughs> um, no, I think it's a good thing. And I think um, given that many people in the West spend their time complaining about how much um, money and blood and treasure it costs to police the world, which America seems to think it does, it might be a good idea for some other people to try to do the same thing or to maybe approach it all in a different way. Who are the new actors, really, and how are the, the real uh, weight in the new, this new uh, multipolar world? Um, that's a good question. Well, the United States is still a major actor, although it has a, um, um, a rather unreliable, erratic person as president now. Um, the, big, the big new actor in the world is China, although it's a very cautious actor, um, just because of its sheer economic power, which will, in the next 10 years or so, it'll become the greatest economic power in the world. Um, it doesn't mean to say that all the Chinese are going to be rich. I mean, their average, the average income of a, China, of a Greek person would make most Chinese very envious, and Greece is not a rich country. Um, and then Russia, I suppose, plays the role of being like the Joker in a pack of cards. Mm -hmm. It plays a very weak hand. Its economy is the size of that of Italy. It has actually much smaller armed forces than Turkey or Pakistan, and if you count the number of troops. But it acts as a disruptive element in the world. So you think Putin is not as strong as people mm -hmm. think? No, I don't at all. I, I think he, he's a clever tactician. I don't think he's much of a strategist. He's a clever tactician who knows how to use a weak set of cards very, very effectively and um, takes, takes advantage of a, a, a mood of indecision in the West, um, takes advantage of the fact um, that, in a way, there's been a loss of Western self-belief in the last decade or two, and he presents himself as the defender of um, orthodox Christian conservative values, for example, um, which is a new thing that one has to deal with. And he has many admirers in the West. Mm -hmm. And uh, what about the new, because you said that the United States now have Trump in power, mm. but uh, there are coming a lot of these sort of figures like Trump uh, coming in the West. And this is a really, a real threat. Uh, might be something like, uh, will be the finish of the EU, for instance. Would these sort of things coming? Yeah, I think, we, I think the West suffers from um, a particular problem, which is the merger of politics increasingly with media celebrity. And I think that's very dangerous, that, that people are becoming known to the public through the media. I mean, Trump is a 
marvellous example of this, somebody who built up a big TV audience with The Apprentice Show, mm -hmm. which he hosted, and uh, then that projected him up in all propelled him up into political life and there's a lot of examples of that probably to come um, the Russian the Russian leadership consists of ex-secret policemen who are I suppose they're actually a, a, an intelligence agent an American one once said to me that you know when you meet a Russian you think you're dealing with a member of the mafia you're meeting with a member of the secret police and you're meeting with a businessman but in each case it's all three combined in one person it's the same <laughs> it's the same thing um i would say also that actually china is the one with in a sense the most stable government because um the people who run china are first of all highly educated people they've mostly got phds often from western universities and they are test tested in a very clear career path so that they start off running some small province or a modest city then they graduate to running say an average size Chinese province which has the population the same population as Spain 45 million and then at the height of their career they could be running a mega city which is a big region which is semi semi urban semi rural with 120 million people well if you think about it that's bigger than Germany and not much smaller than Russia so by the time these people become qualified to, to, for the top, they have done an awful lot of things in their career. And then they have a one 10 year period at the top, but even within the first five years, their replacements, their successors are being chosen. That's what's going on at the moment. Uh, so you think, you think now that the, some of these leaders that are appearing are, are looking for for, to be a celebrity more than, uh, or, or, or to gain an audience more than have real the power? Well, I think that, again, unlike China, where people are, the, the rulers of China are career party officials. Yes. And when they leave p p power, <coughs> and there is a compulsory retirement age of 68, that's it, out. Yeah. Um, <coughs> unlike that, in the West, increasingly, because we choose younger leaders in their 30s 40s there's a, an obvious danger that they will see political leadership as just part of their career development and then they will want to go on and make a lot of serious money and if you look at someone like david cameron or tony blair in britain they left office the highest office at a young age and they've gone on to make really serious money i mean blair's case maybe 20 40 million pounds since he's left power wow and how about uh, the Brexit in, in the UK? Is it the same phenomena that uh, is dealing also with the media, mediatic stuff that makes it really break with Europe? Well, the power of the conservative press in Britain is not to be underestimated ever. And they were one of the big drivers of, of Brexit. And, uh, but I mean, the Conservative Party's always had a committed group of what I would regard as fanatics on the issue. They talk about nothing else. And um, they and their um, allies in UKIP, although UKIP has gone into decline, they pushed this and it happened. And they will make sure it does happen. They're like, um, what was the name of the three-headed dog in classical mythology in Hades? Cerberus. Yeah. They're like the dog with the three heads, you know, waiting to any sign of Theresa May or anybody betraying the true, true path. They will be. <laughs> and in this scenario, what was the 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 role of Nigel Farage? And uh, because now he pretty much disappeared of politics, isn't it? Hmm. Well, Nigel Farage spent his, in, with whom I share a birthday. Oh, um, uh, really? Yes, nothing else. Um, well, in the Times, our birthdays always appear in the birthday column together next to each other, as I hate seeing. Um, uh, Nigel Farage made an entire career out of this issue, and he's never really um, had any power or responsibility in his life. He's a member of parliament in the European Parliament, oddly enough, and still is. Uh, where you get paid quite a bit of money. And uh, he, um, you know, he, it's mission accomplished for him. But already, for some time, he's been developing a media career, both as a radio chat show, talk show host, and a very American style, but in Britain. And now, of course, he's a presenter on Fox TV, Rupert Murdoch's. I mean, Rupert Murdoch is another fanatical Brexit person. 
and uh, Farage is a, has got his own television program with Fox News. So, you know, he will go off and make millions of dollars as a professional loudmouth. So probably that sentence he says when after Brexit that he wished to recover his country and now he wished to recover his life probably is that uh, now I wish to start a new life. <laughs> yes, of course, yes. Um, he's literally starting a new wife, a life because he's left his German wife in favor of his French girlfriend. So, so his life is literally um, transformed. Huh? Um, but an interesting that he had a German wife and has a French girlfriend. That's another subject, maybe. Um, but he um, will... Uh, the thing he's very good at, which already you saw when he was a member of the European Parliament, because his, his attacks on him and von Rompuy or um, the other guy, Juncker, the heads of the European Parliament, were so funny and vicious. Yes, And they, they became, he became a, an international YouTube sensation. Yes. So he's already created the image, the brand, but now he will turn it into a lot of money in America. And he fancies himself as like a sort of advisor on Europe to Trump. He was straight into Trump Tower to see Trump. Yeah. And uh, how, how would be Brexit now? Because, well, now you have uh, elections in June, but what, what the Brexit will mean for the UK? Would be that bad or how you see the future well, for no, the, the UK? The point of the election is to give the Prime Minister, Theresa May, a large majority and to create en en enough Tory MPs who owe their position in Parliament to her having called an election. Many of them will be new. So she's creating her own sort of faction. And she's not a very clubbable person, you might say. She's a rather cold fish. Um, a vicar's daughter. A priest, you know, yeah. priest daughter. And uh, anyway, with that majority, she will win massively. She will then be able to maybe negotiate a softer divorce. No divorce is soft, but this will be a softer divorce because her own fanatic supporters on the back benches won't be able to stop it. That's what one hopes. And that seems to be her thinking behind calling an election. Yeah. And how about the new French election? Uh, is Marie Le Pen a figure similar than the other, or she's really believe, a believer and wish uh, to wish the power? No, I've, I've studied her quite, quite carefully and closely, and uh, I mean, with no, no, no sexism involved, I would say she, um, her father was a very malicious, witty man in several languages. I mean, to watch him, he's a very witty man, sharp. If you watch her, she's like um, the office manager of a firm of accountants, but people find that reassuring. She's very ordinary, a very good speaker. Um, and she's successfully detoxified the Front National to the point where you don't see the, front, the word Front National in any of the electoral posters. It just says Marine for France. That's all you see. And uh, in that sense, she's quite successful in presenting a reasonable image. Although, as the election grows closer, she's reverting to type and it's getting less reasonable. And I imagine if somebody gets killed in a terrorist attack in Paris in the next week, and in fact there was a shooting incident earlier this afternoon with a bomb, attempted bomb attack, then I think she'll get really tough, the rhetoric, because her rhetoric has sort of moved softer, harder as the election goes on, and now she's in the hard phase. Um, but anyway, that, she's one um, uh, potential finalist in the second round. The other one increasingly is likely to be um, or could be um, Jean-Luc Mélenchon, who's a hardline Marxist communist. So you could have the worst scenario with a, a sort of neo-fascist versus a, a latter-day Marxist fighting in the final round. But I don't personally think that's going to happen. I think it'll be Marine Le Pen and then the, the ex-banker guy Macron, Macron. Um, who is, again, he's a sort of populist, but a centrist populist because he's created a new party out of um, elements of the existing parties. He hasn't got a party. Yeah, but the uh, march is a movement. It's that, a movement. Yeah. 
Yeah. It looks like a party and probably will be a party. It probably will, but he'll have to recruit members of parliament from both the socialists and from the conservatives to make a new parliamentary bloc. Yes. Um, because in a way, what, what, what is more important in the French elections is not the presidential election in April and May, it's actually the parliamentary elections in June. Yes. Because it doesn't matter who becomes president, unless they have a majority in parliament, it's very difficult for them to force through any measures. And at the moment, the, the Front National, Marine Le Pen, they have two MPs, two out of 571. So if she becomes president, okay, but then the whole parliament consists of her opponents. And that's a difficult, then you end up with what's called cohabitation, where she will be president, there will be then a prime minister from another party, and usually that doesn't work, it leads to stalemate and paralysis. Is she really a rightist, as people say, because they present herself as the ultra-right? Is really Marie Le Pen ultra-right? Have ever or to arrive governing in a place? Um, well, I mean, the, where she's coming from, the Front National was set up by her father in 1972, and the people in it were ultra right. They were reactionary Catholics, they were outright French fascists, anti Semites, you know, whatever, skinheads, and they were really a far right party. Um, she's. Uh, de-demonize the image in French is de de de, de, de um, Her economic policies are obviously far to the left of every other of the, all the socialist parties in Europe. This is what's paradoxical. But when she says she wants to increase welfare spending or pensions or whatever, she means just for French people, what are called Francais du souche, yeah. French of the stump, it yes. means. And uh, that means they'll get more benefits, but anybody who's not French is not going to. And then, of course, there are worrying undercurrents in her party that she will use issues like halal or kosher slaughter to ban all of that. And then she will use the headscarf issue for Muslims to ban those little caps that Jews wear. So they're all a bit, a bit worried about what's going to happen. And France has got the biggest Jewish community in Europe, mm. and a lot of them, I think two to three percent, are leaving every year to go to Israel. I would be very worried if I was them. So she is a socialist national nationalist. Yes. Well, we've heard of that before, haven't we? Yeah, yeah, <laughs> but in, in, in all the cases, all this combination, they are socialists, so they are nationally leftist. Yeah, I mean Farage. You know, if you look at all the populist movements, I mean Farage is an ultra free marketeer. I mean, he, his, in his former life, he was a metals trader in the city of London. He made a lot of money. So he's not going to be a socialist. He, he certainly isn't. And then, um, you know, ditto Gert Wilders in Holland is pretty much from that background. And populists in power, like um, uh, Viktor Orban in Hungary, is certainly not a socialist. You know, these are very free market policies. So I wouldn't say they're all, you know, that all the, all the far right are also all socialists, they're not. No. Yeah. No. And not, and not all the populists are no rightist, no leftist. They can be even one in the centre. Yeah, so no, have we have not so far talked about the fact that there are um, very powerful left-wing populist movements in, in uh, Spain, um, in Greece in particular, and I suppose the Labour Party in Britain is a sort of left-wing populist party. And, uh, you know, the, one, the ones in um, Spain, they take Hugo Chavez, as, as indeed does Jeremy Corbyn, the Labour leader, they take Venezuela as their... As an example. ...as their prototype, even now. Even and in the case of the Spanish ones, um, they were getting secret subventions from Venezuela, from Chavez and from Maduro, which was putting money into think, think tanks which employed the party leaders of Podemos. They were getting money from Venezuela. Marine Le Pen gets her money from Vladimir Putin. The money comes from Russia. Oh, wow. So they had a soft loan from a. Well, she says no French bank will lend the Front National money. So she got a nine, nine million euro loan from a Russian bank based in Prague. But it's coming from the Russian government. Oh, my God. And what do you think would be. Is any possibility of way out for Venezuela, or you think it's a lost case? Well, people have been saying it's a lost case for quite some time. 
I would say that the situation is going to degenerate and that he, he and his G2 Cuban secret policemen who are really running the show there, I would have thought, because they, you know, they got free oil from Venezuela and then they supplied them with not just doctors and nurses but secret policemen. I would say the show is, uh, the wheels are coming off the wagon very rapidly and then it just becomes a matter of how far the Cubans and Maduro are prepared to shoot people in the streets. That's, that's really what we're going to see. How can we avoid in this new world this sort of, every sort of populism? Because it looks like a sort of cancer that the people that are probably not responsible of what they, they create, because as you said, probably they are not willing even to become responsible in some cases. Yeah, well that's the problem with them. I mean, they're just mouths that say the most outrageous things, but the actual business of being in government is like working 18 hours a day doing detail and getting on top of things which are not very sexy or very interesting, you know, like where you put roads or railway lines. You know, it's a complicated process and it's very tiring. Um, I would say there's various ways. First of all, um, we need to, everybody needs to broaden the spectrum of people involved in politics so it doesn't just become a narrow little elite with a similar back they're all the same with a similar background who all talk the same jargon you mm -hmm. need people from a variety of backgrounds social classes you know whatever groups who talk like ordinary people who sound like ordinary people can speak in ordinary terms that's point one i think also which is maybe more difficult that you need to Um, stop emphasizing what I call credentialism, in other words, people being judged according to how many university degrees they rack up. Yeah. You need to think about the fact that half the population or more are never going to go to university. They are never really going to move from where they live or where they were born. They're not going to travel very much, maybe the odd holiday. And all they require really is actually respect in how people interact with them. They don't want to be treated as stupid, they don't want to be insulted, they just want respect. And I think all our societies do a bad job of respecting ordinary people doing an ordinary nine to five or nine to nine job. That's very simple to fix. And then of course we should be implacably um, ruthless in dealing, as indeed our Chinese friends are, with dealing with any form of corruption, uh, which we're not very good at. No. I mean, in Britain, you know, the, bank, the Royal Bank of Scotland almost ruined the entire British economy because it greedily and ignorantly overexpanded itself. So it bought sort of American hedge funds. It didn't know what these people do because the, the chief executive was more focused on a new build, building a new headquarters in Edinburgh and choosing blue and purple carpets. That's what he was doing. But he was buying hedge funds in America. He didn't know what a hedge fund did. So you ended up with a bank which was actually, its balance sheet was as big as Britain's GDP. One bank was as big as the GDP of the whole country. And then something went wrong. But nobody has gone to prison for this. Yeah. Only retrospectively did we introduce a crime called reckless banking. It is now an offence. Yeah. It should have always been an offence. Yeah, but we are so getting used in Latin America, these sort of things. Yeah. Are we now? Aren't we? Yes. Yeah, we are. Yeah. Indeed. Yeah. And um, I wonder about the Middle East. Is there any hope of that the region settle? Or no. No. No, not at all. Um, I mean, both Putin and Trump say they're going to try and broker a peace deal between the Israelis and the Palestinians. Um, but that's not going to happen. Why would it? And uh, the war in Syria will just rage on. I mean, after all, the civil war in Lebanon went on for 15 years. This has been going on for five years. Yes. It's got a long way to go. Yes. Uh, and it's not Lebanon. And then there's a big struggle for dominance, for, for mastery going on between Saudi Arabia and Iran, which covers the whole region. Um, and that's not going away either, which is ultimately at root It's not just a clash between Sunni, Sunni Saudis and Shia Iranians. It's between, um, you know, an advanced 
country with 80 million people, many of whom are young, i.e. Iran, which has had a parliament since 1906 and women in it since 1923, and which has women ministers, etc., etc., the women in powerful positions there, and Saudi Arabia where a woman can't even drive a car. And unfortunately, the West seems to be backing the place where the women can't drive a car, and which has also, by the way, been responsible for propagating Wahhabist poison throughout the entire world. You know, when you see an extremist mosque in, in Southeast Asia, in Bangladesh or Pakistan, or in Africa, West or East, they've paid for it. And not just there, they've paid for the ones in Paris, London, Berlin, everywhere. And yet they're our allies. They're not my allies. Europe is not growing. Muslim will be, it's not growing because uh, they, they don't have that much children anymore, mm -hmm. Europeans. Mm -hmm. If it's so, Muslims will be majority in, in the future, will be an Islam Europe? No, I think that's, um, I think, I mean, I've read five or six books by different people who are either Jews or gays who tend to um, pr make precisely that point. Um, you know, there's an Israeli author called Bat Eor, well, she lives in Switzerland, who wrote a book called sort of, you know, Europe as an Islamic state. Um, and then there are lots of gay authors in Scandinavia who, you know, I've got lots of gay friends who I would generally describe as Islamophobic. Um, uh, because, of course, they think that Muslims would throw them off a roof and yes. they might be right. Um, I think that you have to be careful what you say because not for politically correct reasons, but that, you know, Iran now has virtually the same familial demographics as Western Europe. People have 2.5 children. They're, they're, as their society's modernized, they've got, you know, the birth rate has declined. Yes. You only need a lot of children in a peasant economy where there's no social safety net. Um, so I think to say that they will just infinitely have lots of children is probably not right because they will gradually adjust especially if they're integrated or assimilated they will adjust their family patterns to the local norm i think yeah. that's a more realistic scenario um, but at the same time one should actually uh, perhaps we should have done a, in europe people should have done a better job of looking you see, when you, I, I did um, a lot of work some years ago on how people regarded immigration back in the 60s. And you know, the, the, the question of religion never arose. Nobody ever even thought of asking anything about religion. It was irrelevant. Nobody thought of asking about it. So when they needed people to work to drive buses or to work in the National Health Service, they just saw it in pure economic labour terms. They didn't think about it as a religious issue. Why would you? But of course now it's become an issue and uh, one might have to make conscious choices about what sort of people you're bringing into the country. And I don't see why countries can't control their own borders and their own immigration policy. I mean, personally, I wouldn't mind um, you know, if we took hundreds of thousands of Hong Kong Chinese or Vietnamese or whatever, because I know they're hard-working, industrious people who would adapt to life in Britain and make a lot of money, make us very rich. They would cause nobody any problems. That would be great, but unfortunately we can't make those sort of choices. So it's a way back to Adam Smith. So a country, the wellness of a country is in relationship of the working of the people. Yeah, sort of, yeah, yeah. Well, you know, the Hong Kong Chinese are world famous for being incredibly entrepreneurial people, ditto the Vietnamese, and one would be a very different country if you had them there rather than people from some village in Kashmir or in Pakistan who just really want to replicate life in a Pakistani village but in London or Birmingham. That's not a great addition to our society. No, it's not. Okay, and then if the Saudis come along and build fancy mosques for them where the clerics are preaching mad things that we're all what they call kuffar, you know, sort of almost subhuman. We're like pigs, degenerate pigs, and, mm -hmm. you know, we're, we're destined for hell. Then that is really unhealthy. But then at the same time, we're allies of the Saudis. We sell them an awful lot of weapons systems. 
our elites are corrupted by them. You know, retired generals make a lot of money selling weapons to the Saudis. They work for arms companies. So until we sort out in our own minds how we regard these issues, we will never do anything effective. Anyway. So it's a different world than before, but we, ha we need to learn to deal with it. Yeah, I'm quite optimistic about it. I mean, I'm not optimistic about Trump. Um, You're not? No, not in the least about Trump. He wouldn't finish? No, I'm saying I'm not optimistic about his presidency. Yeah. I think rarely has somebody so low grade ever become American president. But um, I'm more optimistic about how, you know, this need not result in a catastrophe and he'll be gone in four years. Either he'll be impeached or he'll get bored and retire. I can't see him doing two terms. Yeah, amazing. Thank you, Michael. Thank Pleasure. you for this Always interview. Always nice to be here. Yeah, for us it's fantastic that you're here and we wish to have you again And I'm a very great soon. fan of Red Cultural as well. Ah, I like it. Thank you. It's a very good magazine. I recommend it to everybody. Te queremos agradecer, Michael, por esta entrevista y para nosotros en la Red Cultural es un honor volver a haber tenido aquí en Chile, lo tuvimos hace dos años atrás a Michael Burley y esperamos volver a tenerlo porque es un gran amigo de la Red Cultural. Muchas gracias a todos. Gracias.